you welcome to my channel I'm super excited for you to be here and in this video I'm going to be talking about my psych rotation so just give you details on what the six weeks were like and what we did during these six weeks as well as the high yield topics that were covered in new world as well as that most likely will be seen in step two and they're definitely seen in step one so if you're interested keep on watching I also actually found out what I wanted to do or what I want to go into uh, in this rotation but I don't know if I'm going to reveal it just yet because I still want to confirm it fully um, and I still need some time. But let's get started. So we had two weeks of inpatient, two weeks of outpatient, one week of consult, and one week of CPAP, totaling into six weeks. So the inpatient, what is inpatient? So essentially you have these, um, these patients that are not fully stable and they need time to become stable. So for example, someone that has mood disorder, they had just a manic episode just recently and uh, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder type one, for example. This uh, patient needs to become stable so we keep them in the inpatient unit until they've stabilized and then we discharge them and then so that's your inpatient so these are just unstable patients that we need to keep watch uh, we can either discharge them all together on the medications and make sure that they follow up with their outpatient clinic or we um, send them off to this partial program or picks them up and takes them for like a therapy session. Um, the outpatient is going to be the patients that are stabilized on medication and you just want to see them based on appointment and just to see how things are going. And this is a very chill um, environment. See them, how are they doing, what's, uh, what's going on with your medication, any side effects, um, so those kind of things. And then you, you know, they go home and that's it. And then you have the consult. So I love consult. And consult is someone, for example, in the uh, pediatrics or the medical floor, they bring up how they want to commit suicide. Now a psych has to come in and evaluate the patient to see if there is actual uh, risk factors for suicide. Or so for example, delirium, and they outruled all the medical uh, causes. So now you have to be brought in as a consult to see why the delirium is there. So with consults, you're like kind of all over the place in the hospital because everyone's kind of bringing you in. So that seems a lot more fun. So actually during consult, I figured out what I wanted to be. Um, and it was actually really cool because it just gave me this feeling of um, comfort because I feel like I was really uncomfortable because I didn't know what I wanted to go into, specialize into, and everyone else around me did. Because the sooner you find out, the more you're able to prep towards that um, specialty. So now that I know, like I feel good. I mean, I haven't really been pre prepping towards it as much, but I feel good about it. I'm excited. So anyway, so consult was uh, was a lot of fun. I we got to see a lot of cases. We got to see delirium cases, uh, and just like. And someone, okay, so there was one patient thought that she was seeing bugs. So she said that uh, there's like bugs, like these micro bugs that are within her eyes. So the, the a resident was like, okay, so let's see it. Let's see it. She's like, oh, you won't be able to see it. So then he's, she's like, okay, let me try to take it out. And then she pulled it out and she's like, see? <laughs> and she's like, and we're like, what color is it? And she's like, green. And then we're like, oh, we can't see it. She's like, oh, it's micro. Then why can you see it? It's, it's just... It was interesting. So it was like crazy to like see it versus read about it. Um, it was a definite difference and I actually absolutely loved it. So CPAP is an emergency uh, psych unit. So just like you have an emergency department, you also have a psyched emergency department and that's what CPAP is. A lot of kids actually that come in here. I saw a couple oppositional defined patients actually. They were little kids. Of course, this is commonly seen in kids. And then I also saw a conduct disorder patients which can lead to what antisocial disorder personality disorder so yeah CPAP was actually one of my favorites actually so yesterday we had a heroin addict and she was withdrawing someone that she knew originally we thought it was her boyfriend but it wasn't he overdosed and died and then the next day she came in and she was going through withdrawal symptoms and she was trying to commit suicide which she denied later but um 
she was feeling really, really um, uncomfortable. And actually with heroin or opioid withdrawal, it's just very, very uncomfortable. It's not life-threatening, such as benzodiazepines, that's life-threatening. Heroin and cocaine withdrawal is not life-threatening, it's just very uncomfortable. So what you do is treat these symptoms. So this patient was wanting to get methadone. So obviously, um, we weren't gonna provide the methadone, we were just gonna help her with the uh, symptoms. What was offered to her was Motrin to help with the stomach issues, and she was denying it. She was like, no, I want a methadone. She was just screaming so, so loud. She also had cops around her. So at one point, the residents were in the back, and the nurses were just like, oh my God, like she's so annoying, but they weren't, because she was denying the Motrin. She didn't want it, she wanted heroin, she wanted a methadone. So then what ended up happening was I went out and um, I went to her and I was like listen like you said you know that you're going through withdrawal symptoms so the best that we can do is help your symptoms I was trying to explain the whole ordeal comfortable she was just moving around a lot and I was like you know that we can't give you methadone you know you can't get heroin here and then at one point she was like oh don't lecture me don't lecture me I love you but I don't need to hear this right now I was like okay well at the end of the day like the only thing we can help you is your symptom let me know when you decide that you do want the Motrin uh, and then she was like ah, and then she starts screaming not at me but she was just like oh my god I'm so uncomfortable but anyway so basically they're very uncomfortable I like seeing like crazy cases I actually at one point I wanted to become a psychiatrist when I was um first thinking about medicine. Within the rotation, we also had other things that we had to turn in. For example, we had to do evaluations. So for evaluations, we also had to do two case write-ups and a focus write-up. So these are just long write-ups about patient and like just detailed information on them. Oh, and another thing with psych rotation, so you have to document everything in, and that goes for every um, department. However, with psych, like there's so much details. The materials I used to study for psych uh, thus far has been UWorld, of course. <laughs> uh, I know some people wanna save it for when they study for step two, but um, I decided to use it as I go. So I'm using UWorld, I'm using Psych First Aid Psych. They have a book for just psych and it's excellent. Um, I actually have the PDF version. So um, that's what I read and it has, I haven't finished through all of it, all of the chapters, but it's really good. Online med ed for some of the videos and my school provides Kaplan QBank. So I'm actually on the verge of uh, finishing that I still have like 90 some um, it's not that many questions you world doesn't have that many questions either so you can easily get through all of them so I'm actually starting since it's um, I have only one week left so I'm slowly getting on to the Kaplan as well I did 40 questions today and it wasn't bad start next week slowly do the MBMEs as well so that's about it with the sources uh, it's, I'm trying to keep a minimum I know there's like firecracker and all that uh, I do like firecracker but I haven't really used it uh, studying for my shelves really but if you're if you just want one source I'm sure that's a great source to use okay so let's get started with the uh, most high yield topics that you should know that are gonna be really really helpful both for um, the hospital itself as well as your shelf exam and uh, step one and step two honestly this is, these are materials that you have to know on just about every exam so when i say mood disorder you want to think of two major things major depressive disorder and bipolar um, bipolar one and bipolar two and you have to be able to differentiate between them and then you also have psychothymia dysthymia and persistent depressive disorder as well so very very important to know major depressive disorder you might as a primary doctor be dealing with um, patients that have major depression so it's important to know what you have to treat them with and such so first of all how do you identify a major depressive disorder so remember SIG E caps these are um, obviously it's a mnemonic that you need to know and they have to have five out of nine in order for them to be considered as major depressive disorder and one of the two have to be there which is anhedonia which is lack of interest entirely and in the things that they usually had interest in or they have to have depressed mood with the bipolar disorder whenever you read a vignette you can pick up whether it's bipolar one or two really quickly by seeing whether it, there is any manic episodes if there's a manic episode and the symptoms for that is dig fast so that's the mnemonic for it if you see those uh, symptoms in a patient 
then you want to think of a manic episode and as soon as they have at least one manic episode they're automatically termed as bipolar one they do not have to have major depression to be considered as bipolar one they have to have a manic episode now you can have a hypomanic episode with a manic episode and be considered as bipolar one whereas in bipolar two you do have to have major depressive disorder along with a hypomanic so what's the difference between manic and hypomanic is the severity manic episode you are impaired functionally occupationally socially um, with hypomanic there's no functional impairment they just have like this uh, hyperactivity where they get a lot of things done uh, versus the manic where they're not able to functionally work and i heard that for the shelf exam you won't see like too many of these diagnoses you have to know more of the substance and the drugs that are involved but these are definite easy points that you can uh, get and then you have your psychotic issue brief psychotic episodes schizophrenia schizo friend of form schizo effective um, as well as mood disorder with psychotic features so you have to be able to differentiate them timing is gonna be your friend so a brief psychotic episode is going to be less than one month and greater than a day schizophrenia it has to be all the symptoms that you see in a schizophrenic patient however it has to be there for more than six months so if they tell you two months you right away eliminate schizophrenia and you're going to go with schizophreniform schizophreniform is going to be between one to six months they'll get you by just giving you three months that it has been only there for three months so you have to be able to pick that up and then you have the mood disorder with psychotic features so that's basically whether you have uh, bipolar or major depressive disorder but it has psychotic features so whatever mood disorder they have they have uh, hallucinations delusions at the same time whereas with schizoaffective disorder it's basically schizophrenia but they also have mood disorder with it it's going to have a time period where it's just schizophrenic symptoms and no mood disorder symptoms for two or more weeks whereas mood disorder with uh, psychotic features both are going to be at the same time as the mood disorder you'll actually see a lot of patients with schizophrenia like so many days. so next we have delirium now delirium is really important to be able to differentiate from like dementia and other neurological cognitive um, disorders so with delirium it's fluctuating that is keyword on there. You always want to first with delirium see if there's an underlying cause um, that's medically, for example, UTI in elderly. If it's an elderly, you always want to make sure that they don't have UTI. Naturally, with delirium, it's so important to recognize because it's a medical emergency and if you do not treat it the chances of that patient dying is really really high and they ask you how you're going to treat the symptoms you're going to say um with haldol however if they tell you how are you going to treat the symptoms and you have underlying cause that's what you're going to pick because ultimately even if you give them the um the haldol that's just going to help their symptom that's not going to treat the actual problem but if they ask you how are you going to treat this patient then you're gonna say the underlying cause and if that's an option you're definitely gonna pick that one you can also treat them with risperidone so if the haloperidol is not there pick risperidone which is an antipsychotic um, medication both antipsychotic ones first generation haloperidol and the other one risperidone is a second generation now going into the drugs so you have SSRIs you have SNRIs you have TCAs uh, MAOIs as well as the other atypical antidepressants. So everything that I named were our antidepressant medications. Most likely, you're gonna pick sertraline, fluoxetine, or citalopram, escitalopram. Those are SSRIs that you have to know um, because most likely those are the answers. So you're going to not pick based on the efficacy because they're all good at what they do. However, um, the SSRI has the better side effect profile compared to like MAOIs. You never want to pick an MAOI unless it's completely mandatory because the only time you pick it if, if there is a refractory and then there's particular cases where you pick it otherwise don't pick an MAOI so SNRIs and SSRIs are like cousins like they're both very good you can treat someone with SNRI or SSRI um, and they have a similar uh, side effect profile including the fact that they both cause sexual dysfunction. That's the most common side effect that you have to worry about with SNRIs and SSRIs, and that's commonly the reason why people stop taking them. They want to switch out. 
So that's something to acknowledge and also know what you would switch out to. The only time that they really, actually I talked about this in my Instagram, the only time they'll make you pick between the two is if they have chronic pain. So if they have diabetic neuropathy, you know, the pain that comes with it, you're going to treat them with an SNRI over an SSRI if they have depression. So someone with depression and chronic pain, pick an SNRI, such as venlafaxine, and duloxetine. One of the most important thing with TCAs that you need to know is that it can um, cause death by arrhythmia. So because of the uh, electrolyte imbalance that it can cause, you can uh, it can lead to death. So you want to check an EEG in a patient that is on TCAs, and that's what they'll commonly test you on. Um, it also has an anticholinergic effect, so that's another thing that you need to recognize with TCAs. So these are the side effect profiles that you really need to know because they'll test you on that for sure. Overdose in TCAs is very lethal and it can cause uh, arrhythmias something that they commonly ask about MAOIs plus a, an SSRI if they anytime at any point talk about those two in combination you want to think of serotonin syndrome that's what they would talk about so anything that causes an increase in serotonin levels and then you have trazodone which is sedative it's uh, for depression and it causes priapism as well as um, good for elderly whereas mirtazapine it causes weight gain it's sedative and of course if it's uh, for depression so if someone needs to gain weight you're gonna pick mirtazapine if someone is already obese you do not pick mirtazapine in terms of substance abuse so now you have to be able to differentiate between between intoxication and um, and withdrawals and I have the worst of luck with those like I whenever I'm studying it I'm like okay I understand it but then whenever I get a question I'm like fudge like ugh, it just it messes me up a lot and then it, it becomes discouraging and you're just like I don't want to study anymore <laughs> just kidding Thank you so much for watching and I really hope that was helpful. Please make sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, do share this video as that will be really helpful. You can also follow me on my Instagram account and my Snapchat, which is Mercy Medical, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye guys.